Hey everyone, Michael Unger here with another edition of Ask an Astronomer here on unceded territory of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. The sun just came out, actually it's been raining all day today, and as usual we are here with our astronomer Marley, uh, just a couple doors down from me. Hey Marley, how's it going? It's good, I'm glad the sun is back, I don't like the rain very much. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, for this special edition of Ask Astronomer, we have brought in uh, some heavy hitters. We have Ken Podwalski, who is the executive director of the Lunar Gateway Project with the Canadian Space Agency. Hello, Ken. How are you? I am good. How are you, Michael? Good afternoon. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much for taking hey, time. Good afternoon, Marley. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to leave you out there. <laughs> That is okay. I am here to do the PowerPoint. It's not my show today, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, that's right. So for all of you watching out on YouTube land, also on Facebook as well, uh, if you've got a question for Ken or for Marley, you know, I guess if you have any questions under the universe, uh, throw them into the chat and we will certainly uh, answer them. But our topic for today is a very, yeah, very, very exciting uh, project uh, that we've been talking a lot about here at the Space Center. Uh, uh, for the last several months, and we will continue as we go into the new year, because we've got lots of programs around the Lunar Gateway. Yeah. So, Ken, you are the executive director of this project with the Canadian Space Agency. Why don't you just start off by telling us what is the Lunar Gateway? Uh, so, simple answer. The Lunar Gateway is going to be a small space station that's going to be in an orbit around the moon, and uh, Canada is going to be part of that project. Now, in what, uh, in what role is Canada going to be a part of this project? So is it going to be kind of like mm -hmm. the International Space Station, um, kind of a little bit smaller, but in that lots of countries are uh, adding pieces to it? So, okay, so let's go back through that. So what this is, is in building the International Space Station and working with those partners for the last 25 years, right? Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, we've done great with that. International Space yeah. Station is going to be a page in history. And Canada should be immensely proud of what we've been able to do on that program. Now, all that said, the partnership was looking at things, this was already about oh, seven, eight years ago, saying, where are we going with this? What is gonna be the next step? Because we always looked at ISS as being a stepping stone, right? And that, the whole idea was build a permanent presence in, in low earth orbit, and then develop all the cap capability and capacity. And look what we've done, right? We, from a Canadian point of view, we've evolved our capacity to do operations in space. We've we've advanced space robotics from a uh, from a global point of view. We've demonstrated how you can sustain crew permanently in space in low Earth orbit. We've got new vehicles that come to the International Space Station. The International Space Station is a space hub. Mm -hmm. It is a it is a docking port where vehicles come together and missions come together and things get accomplished. So. When you look at that and you say, well, look what we accomplished with International Space Station. So where do we go with this? And everybody agrees. Everybody knows we want to go to Mars. That's the ultimate grail. But you have to take the moment to just sort of sit down and think about how are we going to do this? And through all that planning and all that thinking, we looked at it and said, yes, we've been to the moon, but we know the moon has more to offer than what was done in the Apollo era. We know that if we do things in a sustainable way and we effectively practice, we take that next stepping stone and we build a space station around the moon and we approach this in a sustainable way. And now we show that we can put together missions and we go out to that distance. We can do sorties down to the lunar surface, come back again, have crew in orbit, monitoring stuff on the lunar surface, have independent missions going to the lunar surface that we can then work with the gateway together with. If we practice all those elements, then we start to look at it and go, you know, if we do that for a 30 day mission and then we do it for a 60 day mission and then we do it for a 200 day mission, mm -hmm. then this starts to actually build the profile of what you're going to need to be able to go and do a Mars mission. So that was the thinking. And what we did as international partners, we all started to look at how could we bring this together? And of course, <clears throat> and I, I, I go to a, a very familiar speech here that I've used in the past, right? Which is, and it's the potato salad speech, right? And so potato salad. everybody loves potato salad, right? And that's the whole reason I use this, this analogy, right? Is you get invited to a party, right? And people invite you to the party and they go, oh, you know, Canada, you guys, you guys do potato salad like there's nobody's business. And that's what we do. We do space robotics. Mm. Okay. We kick butt in space robotics, right? Nobody does space robotics like Canada. Everybody knows Canada for that potato salad. So you get invited to the party 
you make sure you bring the potato salad because that's why you got there. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean you can't bring other things. Just make sure you bring the potato salad, do your thing, right? And then talk about the other things you can bring to the party. Maybe you're going to try something new. You got the potato salad to get in through the door. So this was the idea. We knew that we were we were going to have a place on this vehicle to do space robotics because quite frankly, what we've learned from International Space Station, if you're going to have a vehicle out there on these long kind of missions, you need to have an external robotic system there to manage the outside of the vehicle, to maintain it, to do the assembly, to do all that hard stuff. And that's what we've proven on ISS. So now that we're in the game, we can talk about other things. And of course, we're going to be doing a little micro rover on the lunar surface. Yeah, We're going to be doing a lunar utility vehicle on the lunar surface. So this is how it builds. And this is how Canada becomes that kind of partner that everybody wants. And that's what, and from a national point of view, I want every kid out there to know what Canada's doing out in space, because this is the whole reason that we do this style of stuff is to inspire people. And, you know, maybe not every kid is going to go up and be, a, you know, an astronaut or work in at the Canadian Space Agency or work for a space company. But the inspiration that it brings that we can do these kind of things, that you can develop new technology, that you can you can tackle a problem like this is what you want your 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 youth in Canada to be able to do. And that's how we're going to advance. That's how we push forward. Yeah, excellent. You know, I was just doing a presentation this morning for a, a school class in our science theater, and they looked up above and they said, what is that? And I said, if anyone had um, a $5 bill on them, they would see what it is that they were pointing at, which is the Canada arm, which we have a display of in our theater. Uh, and then I started talking about how there's going to be a new Canada arm. So when you're talking about potato salad, is this what you're talking about? We're, that there's going to be a new iteration of Canada arm. Is there other types nice. of robotics that we're going to be adding on? to the Lunar Gateway? So that's exactly it. We're going to do Canadarm 3. Canadarm 3 will be the space robotic system for the Gateway. And we're going to change it up a little bit, right? So we're taking the same kind of approach, right? So, you know, a large arm to kind of go and do the big heavy stuff, like the real grunt work and moving big things around. And on the International Space Station, of course, we had Dexter. Dexter was, Dexter is awesome, right? Because it's a two-armed robot, can do all kinds of maintenance activities and do repairs on the outside of the space station. But on Gateway, Gateway is going to be tough, right? And like, let's let's start with this. Space is hard, okay? It's really hard, right? Building the International Space Station was super hard. Going and doing a small space station in deep space is the next level, right? All kinds of new challenges. And the first thing you got to deal with is you just can't get all the mass you want up there. Every mission right. is going to be significant. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be... You can only get so much out there. So our robotic system has to be a little thriftier. So we're actually going to take an approach where instead of having a a two-armed robot like Dexter, we're going to have a small dexterous arm. And that small dexterous arm is basically going to be able to walk around on the large arm. So we're going to be able to do the big stuff. We're going to be able to do fine dexterous operations with that small arm. And because we're going to be in deep space and we can't, we don't have the luxury of being able to repair the system and be able to do a spacewalk if we had to to go out there. We need our system to be entirely self-maintainable by robotics. So that small arm's job is to actually repair the big arm if we need to, right? So this is the kind of extra thinking we've had to kind of put into Canada Arm 3. We're going to have some specialized tools. We're going to have, we're going to have our own little toolkit that we're going to actually carry around with us and actually be able to operate our robotic system off the top of it. So there's a few kind of novel ideas that kind of come into play, but that's the general idea with what we're doing with Canada Arm 3. Excellent. And any word if they're going to update the $5 bill with the new Canada Arm 3? <laughs> well, first of all, we're going to try and get all the money, right? So we want to, we want to get the $5 bill, the $10 bill, the $20, right. the $50, the $100, right? <laughs> we've done pretty well in the past because we've had the $5 bill now. And in the hundred dollar bill, we had the uh, we had radar set on there for quite a while. Excellent, that's right. Um, let's talk about some specifics because I think we we've talked a lot about the International Space Station, you know, uh, on this show and here at this at the Space Center. And as you just talked about, it's a hub. It's a place for astronauts to go and to work, and for many countries internationally to meet and to work in space for a significant period of time. 
So how is the Lunar Gateway going to be different from that? Is it going to have a slightly different function because it's going to, it's going to need to go down to the surface and back? Well, so let's talk about how that's going to play out. So International Space Station is permanently crewed, right? So there is somebody, there have been astronauts on that vehicle for 23 solid years now, mm -hmm. right? Never, never not been on there, right? Now, Gateway is going to be in a, a, a very different approach because what we're going to wind up doing is we're going to have basically an annual meeting or annual mission that's going to go out to the Gateway, bring a crew of four people or four, four crew members. Um, we hope to expand that in the future, but that's the way we're going to start. We're going to go out there for a 30 day mission. And it basically, it's going to take you a few days to get there. It's going to take you, you're going to spend about a week doing stuff, prepping the station, getting ready. You're going to go down to the lunar surface for a week. You're going to come back up. You're going to wrap up after a few days. And then you got to head back and you got to make the trip back. So all that will add up to 30 days. And then as we practice that, as we improve things, as we bring more capability to the vehicle, because we're going to build this vehicle up slowly, like we did with the International Space Station. It took, it took a decade to really put the, the core of that together, right? Yeah. So we're going to do that over about five, six years on, on the gateway. And as we bring that capability together, so we'll have the ability to bring more vehicles, bring up logistics. We're going to have a, a human lander service that's going to that's going to show up there as well. And then that vehicle will be able to go down to the surface. So you'll go up to the gateway into deep space or go orbiting with the gateway. Crew will get set up there. The, the logistics vehicles will already be there with the supplies to build the mission. We'll configure the vehicle to go down to the lunar surface go down, use that as a command station, operate on the lunar surface, do the science and actually start to prep and build the lunar surface site, which is effectively going to be a moon base, right? Mm -hmm. Because don't forget, there's going to be other missions that are going to be coming to the lunar surface and landing there. And the crew is actually going to be able to go down there, deploy those science elements, set things up, actually build capability on the lunar surface. All this is all these, as all these links fit together, what you're doing is you're building a sustainable path to continuously building that capability. And this is what we this is what we did with the ISS. This is what we want to do with Gateway. Excellent. You know, it's actually, uh, well, it's not so much a coincidence. I think we planned this, but today is actually the anniversary of the International Space Station. And I was just, you know, realizing that for anyone that's 23 and younger, they have never lived without human presence on the International Space Station, which I think is, is incredible. It uh, This blows my mind, okay? And... Like, if I look back to when I was, you know, whatever, a, a teenager, right? I would have, I would have never, I would have never thought this to be possible. But I always looked at it, and you know, there's no getting around being, you know, like a little bit nerdy about this stuff, right? And I, I watched all the sci-fi movies, and you know, I'm a Star Trek and Star Wars fan. I mean, you name it, right? And today, I look at it, and I, I think it's so awesome. I think it's absolutely phenomenal that our youth now looks at it and says, having people in space is a, is a completely routine thing. Like that's just normal. And that new normal is just, it, 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 it blows me away because that's everything, you know, getting in, working in this kind of, doing this kind of job, that's everything I always ever wanted to do was like, I just, I, I just want to go do those things that I saw in the movies and I dreamt about as a kid. <laughs> right. And now it's like, that's a piece of reality. Yeah. It's like we changed history, right? I mean, that's just, it's its amazing to me. Wonderful. Well, I'd love to pick your brain a bit more about your role. So we've talked about Canada's role uh, in working um, uh, towards uh, the completion of the Lunar Gateway. We're going to see, of uh, course, astronauts. We do. We have uh, Jeremy Hansen, who's going to be part of the, the Artemis II mission, which is very exciting. So we'll probably get to see more Canadian astronauts. But, but what, at this point in the planning stages, what is your role uh, with the project as executive director? Um, so basically, I get to run this project. I mean, this is a dream come true for me, right? I've been, I've been working at the Canadian Space Agency for 28 years now. And I started off as a contractor. I was doing analysis, uh, looking at kinematics and dynamics of, of what was, you know, Canadarm2 and the, the mobile servicing system. Um, and then I was there when the operations started. So I got to go into that, uh, supporting the operations planning and everything. I got to be, I became the manager of mission operations. I got to run the missions uh, for every shuttle flight. We 
basically put together this phenomenal team uh, to go and tackle these missions. Um, and then that's that's been going on since 2001, right? Um, wow. I became the program manager for for the International Space Station. So that was uh, that was just, I mean, uh, again, a dream come true. Just just in terms of like, I never thought that I could do that. Um, I dreamt about it, but to, to actually do it was great. I mean, and then the you know the business of like working on the Lunar Gateway and everything, and it was it's one of those things where you look at it and go, so I know the space station. I've done this for twenty something years now, and and I'm and I'm comfortable and I'm confident and I feel good about it. And then now we're going to go and do this this lunar initiative. And you go, you start thinking about it and you go, this is going to be hard. I mean, this is all, like this is starting from not starting from scratch, but like really kind of like all the way from the ground up again, like building up a whole new system and everything, and a whole new set of requirements, a whole different model in terms of how this is going to work and everything. And then you look at it and go. And this was the, I remember saying this to my wife, which was, how do you say no to the moon? <laughs> yeah. How do you say no? Like you can't, I, I, I can't, everything in my, everything in my, every fiber of me has wanted to do this kind of stuff. And so this opportunity came around and I, I just jumped on it and said, yeah, I, I would love to be, I would love to take Canada to this next level. I'd love to be a piece of that. Um, so what we're doing is we're now getting ready to, we're, we're starting to wrap, we're just about the point where we're wrapping up phase D, which is <clears throat> you go through these big development projects and you go through phase A, which is kind of laying everything out. Phase B is actually like laying out the requirements and, and coming up for the preliminary design. And then you go into phase C, which is of course, like finish off all the detail, do all the hard work, the analyses and everything to prove that you've got everything figured out. And then phase D, build the system. And then, of course, phase E is operation. Now you go do, you operate this in deep space for 15 years, right? So we're at the right, right about now, we're just coming up on the end of phase B. We're getting ready to do a preliminary design review. Um, I have a fantastic team, right, uh, of, of Canadians that we pulled together from all over the country, um, uh, from, you know, different backgrounds, some of, some of whom came from space station. Some are coming from different parts, which is just fantastic because it's just these like bringing in new ideas and looking at different ways and, and approaches and stuff like that. Um, and I've got this, this great diverse team that I've got uh, has really like worked hard at sort of setting all this up. And then of course we've got our supplier, which is McDonald Detweiler Associates, MBA. Yeah. They're building the system, right? And they've got, they've got like a, a few hundred engineers working on this now, right? So it's really starting to get very, very real. Like now we're at the point where everything is actually kind of coming together. So we're going to do preliminary design review, hopefully in about March. And when that goes well, it's going to, it's going to kind of go from there because now we're going to start into the real hardcore analyses and doing the engineering testing, building models, building prototypes. Um, it's, it's, it's actually quite an exciting time now. I mean, what? it's really feeling like it's starting to move. Yeah. Yeah. It's so exciting. And we have uh, MDA, uh, office over, uh, here in, in the Lower Mainland as well. So uh, for all of you watching uh, on YouTube and Facebook, uh, we've got about 10 more minutes uh, with uh, with Ken Podwalski, the Executive Director uh, with the Lunar Gateway Project with the Canadian Space Agency. So if you want to get a question in, uh, put those questions in now. Uh, for any young people that might be watching this, Ken, you know, you talked a little bit about your background. You This is something you've been dreaming about your entire life. Maybe talk a little bit about some of the education that you uh, did uh, leading up before you started working with the Canadian Space Agency. Agency and maybe talk about what opportunities there might be for young Canadians uh, in the future to get involved working with the moon. Well, okay. The first thing I'm going to say is, and like we hire a lot of students, okay. And we hire a lot of like young graduates, engineers and stuff like that, that come to the Canadian Space Agency. And the conversation I always have with them is, it is of paramount importance that you find something that when you wake up in the morning, you want to go do it, okay? Mm -hmm. Because work is going to be there's only a, like there's only a handful of things in life that matter, right? Health, eat well, sleep well, love, and find something that you do something you want to do, okay? It's important. Um, 
I think so from my point of view, I, I went I went to engineering school. I did a, a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering with an aerospace option. Right. I actually started my first three years of my career. I was I was actually in the pharmaceutical industry okay. working on R&D devices, drug delivery systems. Right. But I never stopped going to school at night doing my master's and I was doing a master's in aerospace engineering. And that was just that was just my my passion that just sort of kept going at night. And I was always sort of like, yeah, I'd like to try and keep going with this as much as I can. And I actually got all the way up to the end of that to the point where I had to do a stage opportunity. And I got to I got to I fell into this. I didn't it wasn't even a stage. I fell into a job opportunity with a contracting company working for Canadian Space Agency. And so for for what what is out there for 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 youth to go look at. So first of all, go look at these co-op opportunities, right? We 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 jump on this all the time and there's a lot of companies out there that do, right? And whether it's whether it's in at the Canadian Space Agency doing space stuff or whether it's aerospace or whether it's medical or whatever turns your crank, whatever is the thing that motivates you and the thing you dream about, go look for those opportunities, okay? The other thing is, is don't get boxed in. Like there are so many different things to be done on if this is what's exciting for you, right? So validate that that's, that's going to be the thing that you're going to, that's going to motivate you. But then open your mind and go, you can do safety analyses. You can do administrative work. You can do legal work. You can do, there's all kinds of aspects of this that all lead into this space sector and they're, they all count. They're all part of it. So yes, you can be an astronaut. You can be a program manager. You can be an engineer. You could be an administrator. You could be, there's all kinds of fits for this. So look for, if, even if it's, you don't want to do engineering, but space is something that really motivates you. There's ways to get into space that doesn't mean you have to be an engineer. Yeah, excellent. And when you're talking about your background and how you got mm-hmm. into um, it sort of like aeronautical engineering and space engineering, uh, was that because of, was that because of the Apollo era? Was that sort of like what drew you towards that? Because of course you couldn't have fathomed, you know, being able to work on a orbiting space station. But back then, was that sort of like what the inspiration was? I don't know if it was the Apollo era so much as probably I'd say the space shuttle era. Okay. was actually kind of what I kind of latched onto. And I, I found that fascinating. And I saw the, th- the stuff that you could do um, in low Earth orbit with a vehicle like the space shuttle. And of course, we had the original cannon arm on there, right? So yeah. it, there was a bit of a fit with that. On, but there's also just the, like the, the, the sci-fi fan part of me, right? Like, the, <laughs> like the, all the different movies and the shows and everything like that, that I've, all, I've just always... And, you know, as you watch that stuff and you like, you know, obviously I was going down a technical path with my education and ultimately engineering and stuff. So you learn about this stuff, right? And you, 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 you pull the things together and you, so like you, you, you very quickly put together like, okay, well, that's not the real stuff. Like Armageddon is never going to happen. Like the movie Armageddon, like that was just, it never, it was never going to fit. Right. Yeah. But then there's so many other things that you look at and go, yeah, yeah, that's, we could do that. We could build us, we could build a spaceport. <laughs> in in space like there's no reason not to and that's yeah. what we're doing that's what we've done we did it with the iss and we're, we're going to put the one that's out that much further out into the water well i gotta ask you now like what what sci-fi is there out there that mm-hmm. you think about when you're um when you're thinking about the lunar gateway is there something you're kind of like in the back of your mind you're like i wonder if we could do that i wonder if we could put that into this project you know i think it comes down to like just stealing little pieces from everything Right. Because you try to keep the stuff that's very real and tangible and you sort of look at it and go, yeah, that would actually be a, a good approach to things. And then you kind of look at the things that are kind of like out on the edge and go, you know, maybe we could figure out something like that. Maybe that's actually possible. Right. And like mm-hmm. we're starting to look at stuff like that for Gateway. There's there are problems with Gateway, like these vehicles coming back from the lunar surface and they're going to be like covered in dust, like the lunar regolith and everything. Yeah. How do you deal with that? It's actually a really interesting and difficult problem right and being that we're going to be cannon arm three and we're going to be on the ext- on the outside of this vehicle we may have to come up with some kind of little tool to go and deionize the surface to allow dust particles to float away and then give it like maybe a little shot of co2 to to blow it off or or to clean off radiators and all this kind of stuff we don't know how this is really going to play like we're just starting to figure all this stuff out now right so 
Yeah, sort of like a doormat. You got to wipe your shoes before you before you go inside, right? <laughs> well, we'll come up with a better analogy than doormat, but yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we've got our last five minutes. Mm-hmm. So the last question that I want to ask you, and I know this may be a bit tough, but for all those watching, you know, right now we're in 2023. You said you're going to do a design review uh, in the springtime. What kind of timeline uh, can we expect to start to see um, some pieces start to come together on the Lunar Gateway? Well, so the Lunar Gateway is going to start in about like right now, per the schedule, uh, October 2025. Okay, they'll launch the first pieces, the first couple modules, right, which will be the propulsion element, and then it'll be the halo, the habitable, uh, the habitation and logistics outpost. So the first pressurized element, if you will. So those two pieces go up first. Now, late 2025, maybe early 26, probably something around there, right? It's hard to say, but on paper, it's late 2025. We'll, all, we'll already have Canadian hardware on that because we have to put all the base points for our robotic system on those modules. And we have to also put all the locations where payloads are going to go. So whether those are science and like utilization payloads, like science experiments that are going to be going on to, into deep space, or whether they're going to be the spare parts, the maintenance items that we're going to need to go and use to maintain the vehicle. So all those all those sites have to be on that on those first couple of modules. So Canadian hardware goes from the very beginning. Then we'll go through Artemis three, Artemis four, which are going to be a couple of big missions. Artemis five will come along. Artemis five is going to be the one where we're going to see Canada Arm three delivered. So it'll be on a logistics mission just before that. And what we're going to have to do is actually self deploy on that mission. That's going to happen in November of 2028 per the schedules today. Now of course. We're waiting to see how everything comes together, right? We're we're you know, we're, we're talking to SpaceX about a starship coming to, to to the gateway. We're talking to Blue Origin about Blue Moon coming to the gateway. Mm. So we'll see how the configuration comes together. But our plan today is we're ready for late 2028 with Canada Arm Three. Excellent. Uh, well, this is a very exciting development. You know, final question, you know, how excited are you for Jeremy Hansen, you know, uh, to be a Canadian, uh, to be orbiting around the moon? Uh, and he's been with the Canadian Space Agency a long time as well, and he finally gets his chance. Uh, he gets the chance he deserves. They're, they, I mean, this is going to be a big deal, right? So this is going to be the furthest any human has ever been from the planet. It's going to be a checkout mission, right? So there's going to be like a lot of work. This is far from being a joyride. This is going to be intense checking out of the system. Mm-hmm. And honestly, there's there's only there's only a limited number of people on the planet that you want to trust this job to. And Jeremy Hansen is one of them, right? And so, you know, we've always talked like, so people say like, well, you know, if Jer- Jeremy Hansen, it's his turn, it's his chance and everything. Well, he earned his chance, mm-hmm. right? It's not by chance, it's by work. So he's queued up to do it. I can't think of anybody better to have doing that, right? Um, I look at this, I look at these things and I go, you know, because you, you always get that question, like, would you go, would you go into space, you know? <laughs> and I don't know, there's there's things I would do and there's things I, I think I'd be just, I think I'd be too scared, honestly, right? <laughs> um you know, going up for going up for a week on a space shuttle or something like that. I think, yeah, I could. I think I could get myself into that frame of mind. Going up to the space station for six months. Ooh, I don't know. That's that's starting to sound like a little intimidating. Going out in a in what's basically a brand new vehicle, the furthest anybody's ever been from the planet, and 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 being out there for like three weeks. I I I look at that one and go. Wow, oh, that's that's like a little bit of a scary one. So I'm glad it's Jeremy because I know he's the right guy for the job, right? Like there's he's, there's nothing about this that's going to intimidate him. He's he's remarkably on top of this, right? Just in terms of the system and the understanding and everything he's going to have to do. His 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 job there is in his brain like there's nobody's business, right? So yeah. he's the right guy for it. Awesome. Well, uh, Ken Podwalski, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your mm-hmm. busy schedule, helping putting together this amazing project, the Lunar Gateway. We are certainly going to be looking forward to this. And maybe in a couple of years, uh, as we get going, we can maybe have you back on the progress of the Lunar Gateway. Thank you so much, Ken, for joining us and asking Astronomer today. I will, I will come. Every time you invite me, I will come talk to you. And 
thank you for doing what you do because I know you are out there promoting science and technology and you're doing that for our youth and I think that's fantastic. And I hope I did okay because by the way, I'm not an astronomer. <laughs> well, you know who is Ned Morley, uh, who's with us, who's going to be uh, with me in two weeks when we are live back uh, here on YouTube and Facebook. That's going to be November the 16th. And we're going to be uh, continuing this humans in space theme all month, you know, leading up to a couple events that we've got. We've got a family event coming up. If you're in the lower mainland uh, on Saturday night, uh, we choose space, a brand new planetarium show that we're going to be premiering. And then we have an adult night on November the 23rd, where we're going to be talking about uh, some of the aspects that happen to our brain in isolation as astronauts, uh, maybe on the, Lunar Gateway for long periods of time. So we've got some researchers that are going to be talking about some really cool work about what happens to the human brain uh, in isolation as it relates to astronauts. You check out our website, spacecenter.ca, for all the info and tickets. Uh, that's it for me. Marley, thank you so much for doing the visuals. And Ken, thank you for joining us. For all of you out there, clear skies. Thank you.